Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by The Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. So glad you could join me today to get a portion of God's Word. Today we're going to introduce the second book of Samuel. But before we get started with that, I just want to say congratulations to all the listeners that are reading along with me on this podcast. We're just so grateful and blessed that we could do this together as a family. We're just grateful for that. just want to remind everybody that we are listener-supported. And if you can support us, you can visit us at www.thewayministriesri.org. And on the homepage, there's a donate button. If the ministry is blessing you and you can help us out, we greatly appreciate that. Okay, so I just want to say congratulations and keep on reading and God will bless you. I'm going to introduce the second book of Samuel and we'll get started. Second Samuel, introduction. The book of Second Samuel chronicles the remarkable 40-year reign of King David, a man who lives at the halfway point between Abraham and Christ, about 1000 BC. David's triumphs and successes bring Israel to the very zenith of their power, but his all-too-human weaknesses become a national scandal, leading to rebellion within his own family and temporary exile for himself and his court. Through it all, David seeks God zealously and confesses his sins promptly. Vital statistics, author, uncertain. Some have suggested Nathan's son, Zabud, and the prophets Nathan and Gad. Date written, uncertain, perhaps around 930 B.C., not long after David's reign, 1050 to 970 B.C. Purpose. To record the history of David's reign, to validate the Davidic dynasty, and to depict David as the ideal example of good leadership. Themes. Prosperity under David. Ideal leadership. Justice. Consequences of sin. Day 84. March 24th. 2 Samuel chapters 1 to 4. David, King of Judah. Overview. 2 Samuel continues the narrative of 1 Samuel and chronicles David's rise to prominence as Israel's leader. After mourning the deaths of Saul and Jonathan, David assumes the throne as king over Judah, but Saul's dynasty is not to be replaced without a fight. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, claims the throne of Israel, initiating seven years of bloody civil war, intrigue, defections, assassinations, suspense, rival factions, and rebellions. When at last the opposition has been quelled, David rules as king over a united kingdom. Chapter 1, David weeps, mourning Saul's death. Chapters 2 and 3, David wars. Chapter 4, David wins, fighting Saul's house. Insight, Tears of David. 2 Samuel 1.11 Deep mourning for Saul came from the people he had hated and persecuted most severely. Chapter 1 verse 11 Compare this to Jesus grieving over the city of Jerusalem just days before its inhabitants would nail him to a cross. Matthew chapter 23 verses 37 to 39 Insight Stronger and weaker 2 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1 Chapter 3 1 says that David's house grew stronger while Saul's became weaker. To prove the point, the next few verses describe David's abundant offspring through multiple wives. Chapter 3 verses 2 to 5. This was in contrast to the decline of the house of Saul, whose would be successor, Ishbosheth, experienced the humiliation of losing a concubine to his top military leader. Chapter 3 verses 6 to 8. 2 Samuel chapter 1. David learns of Saul's death. After the death of Saul, David returned from his victory over the Amalekites and spent two days in Ziklag. 
On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's army camp. He had torn his clothes and put dirt on his head to show that he was in mourning. He fell to the ground before David in deep respect. Where have you come from? David asked. I escaped from the Israelite camp, the man replied. What happened? David demanded. Tell me how the battle went. The man replied, Our entire army fled from the battle. Many of the men are dead, and Saul and his son, Jonathan, are also dead. How do you know Saul and Jonathan are dead? David demanded of the young man. The man answered, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear with the enemy chariots and charioteers closing in on him. When he turned and saw me, he cried out for me to come to him. How can I help? I asked him. He responded, Who are you? I am an Amalekite, I told him. Then he begged me, Come over here and put me out of my misery, for I am in terrible pain and want to die. So I killed him, the Amalekite told David, for I knew he couldn't live. Then I took his crown and his armband, and I brought them here to you, my lord. David and his men tore their clothes in sorrow when they heard the news. They mourned and wept and fasted all day for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the Lord's army and the nation of Israel, because they had died by the sword that day. Then David said to the young man who had brought the news, Where are you from? And he replied, I am a foreigner, an Amalekite, who lives in your land. Why were you not afraid to kill the Lord's anointed one? David asked. Then David said to one of his men, Kill him. So the man thrust a sword into the Amalekite and killed him. You have condemned yourself, David said, for you yourself confessed that you killed the Lord's anointed one. David's song for Saul and Jonathan. Then David composed a funeral song for Saul and Jonathan, and he commanded that it be taught to the people of Judah. It is known as the Song of the Bow, and it is recorded in the book of Jasha. Your pride and joy, O Israel, lies dead on the hills. Oh, how the mighty heroes have fallen. Don't announce the news in Gath. Don't proclaim it in the streets of Ashkelon, or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice, and the pagans will laugh in triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fruitful fields producing offerings of grain. For there the shield of the mighty heroes was defiled. The shield of Saul will no longer be anointed with oil. The bow of Jonathan was powerful, and the sword of Saul did its mighty work. They shed the blood of their enemies and pierced the bodies of mighty heroes. How beloved and gracious were Saul and Jonathan. They were together in life and in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. O oh, women of Israel, weep for Saul, for he dressed you in luxurious scarlet clothing and garments decorated with gold. Oh, how the mighty heroes have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies dead on the hills. How I weep for you, my brother Jonathan. Oh, how much I loved you, and your love for me was deep, deeper than the love of a woman. Oh, how the mighty heroes have fallen. Stripped of their weapons, they lie dead. Second Samuel chapter 2 David anointed king of Judah. After this, David asked the Lord, Should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord replied. Then David asked, Which town should I go to? To Hebron, the Lord answered. David's two wives were Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel. So David and his wives and his men and their families all moved to Judah, and they settled in the villages near Hebron. Then the men of Judah came to David and anointed him king over the people of Judah. When David heard that the men of Jabesh-Gilead had buried Saul, he sent them this message. May the Lord bless you for being so loyal to your master Saul and giving him a decent burial. May the Lord be loyal to you in return and reward you with his unfailing love, and I too will reward you for what you have done. Now that Saul is dead, I ask you to be my strong and loyal subjects, like the people of Judah, who have anointed me as their new king. Ishbosheth proclaimed king of Israel, but Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had already gone to Mahanaim with Saul's son Ishbosheth. There he proclaimed Ishbosheth king over Gilead, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, and the land of the Asherites, and all the rest of Israel. 
Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he became king, and he ruled from Mahanaim for two years. Meanwhile, the people of Judah remained loyal to David. David made Hebron his capital, and he ruled as king of Judah for seven and a half years. War between Israel and Judah. One day, Abner led Ishbosheth's troops from Mahanaim to Gibeon. About the same time, Joab, son of Zariah, led David's troops out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. The two groups sat down there, facing each other from opposite sides of the pool. Then Abner suggested to Joab, Let's have a few of our warriors fight hand to hand here in front of us. All right, Joab agreed. So twelve men were chosen to fight from each side. Twelve men of Benjamin, representing Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and twelve representing David. Each one grabbed his opponent by the hair and thrust his sword into the other side so that all of them died. So this place at Gibeon has been known ever since as the Field of Swords. A fierce battle followed that day, and Abner and the men of Israel were defeated by the forces of David. The death of Ashiel. Joab, Abishai, and Ashel, the three sons of Zariah, were among David's forces that day. Ashel could run like a gazelle, and he began chasing Abner. He pursued him relentlessly, not stopping for anything. When Abner looked back and saw him coming, he called out, Is that you? Ashel? Yes, it is, he replied. Go fight someone else, Abner warned. Take on one of the younger men and strip him of his weapons. But Ashel kept right on chasing Abner. Again, Abner shouted to him, Get away from here. I don't want to kill you. How could I ever face your brother Joab again? But Ashel refused to turn back, so Abner thrust the butt end of his spear to Ashel's stomach, and the spear came out through his back. He stumbled to the ground and died there, and everyone who came by that spot stopped and stood still when they saw Ashel laying there. When Joab and Abishai found out what had happened, they set out after Abner. The sun was just going down as they arrived at the hill of Amma near Gia, along the road to the wilderness of Gibeon. Abner's troop from the tribe of Benjamin regrouped there at the top of the hill to take a stand. Abner shouted down to Joab, must we always be killing each other? Don't you realize that bitterness is the only result? When will you call off your men from chasing their Israelite brothers? Then Joab said, God only knows what would have happened if you hadn't spoken, for we'd have chased you all night if necessary. So Joab blew the ram's horn, and his men stopped chasing the troops of Israel. All that night, Abner and his men retreated through the Jordan Valley. They crossed the Jordan River, traveling all through the morning, and didn't stop until they arrived at Mahanaim. Meanwhile, Joab and his men also returned home. When Joab counted his casualties, he discovered that only 19 men were missing in addition to Ashel. But 360 of Abner's men had been killed, all from the tribe of Benjamin. Joab and his men took Ashel's body to Bethlehem and buried him there in his father's tomb. Then they traveled all night and reached Hebron at daybreak. Second Samuel chapter 3 That was the beginning of a long war between those who were loyal to Saul and those loyal to David. As time passed, David became stronger and stronger, while Saul's dynasty became weaker and weaker. David's sons born in Hebron. These are the sons who were born to David in Hebron. The oldest was Ammon, whose mother was Ahinoam from Jezreel. The second was Daniel, whose mother was Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel. The third was Absalom, whose mother was Mekah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. The fourth was Adonijah, whose mother was Haggit. The fifth was Shephatiah, whose mother was Abital. The sixth was Ithrim whose mother was Elga, David's wife. These sons were all born to David in Hebron. Abner joined forces with David. As the war between the house of Saul and the house of David went on, Abner became a powerful leader among those loyal to Saul. One day, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, accused Abner of sleeping with one of his father's concubines, a woman named Rizpah, daughter of Ea. Abner was furious. 
Am I some Judean dog to be kicked around like this? He shouted, After all, I've done for your father, Saul and his family and friends, by not handing you over to David. Is this my reward that you find fault with me about this woman? May God strike me and even kill me if I don't do everything I can to help David get what the Lord has promised him. I'm going to take Saul's kingdom and give it to David. I will establish the throne of David over Israel as well as Judah all the way from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. Ishbosheth didn't dare say another word because he was afraid of what Abner might do. Then Abner sent messengers to David saying, Doesn't the entire land belong to you? Make a solemn pact with me and I will help turn over all of Israel to you. All right, David replied, but I will not negotiate with you unless you bring back my wife, Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come. David then sent this message to Ishbosheth, Saul's son. Give me back my wife, Michael, for I bought her with the lives of a hundred Philistines. So Ishbosheth took Michael away from her husband, Paltai, son of Laish. Paltai followed along behind her as far as Verhurim, weeping as he went. Then Abner told him, go back home. So Paltai returned. Meanwhile, Abner had consulted with the elders of Israel. For some time now, he told them, You have wanted to make David your king. Now is the time. For the Lord has said, I have chosen David to save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from all their other wicked enemies. Abner also spoke with the men of Benjamin. Then he went to Hebron to tell David that all the people of Israel and Benjamin had agreed to support him. When Abner and twenty of his men came to Hebron, David entertained them with a great feast. Then Abner said to David, Let me go and call an assembly of all Israel to support my lord the king. They will make a covenant with you to make you their king, and you will rule over everything your heart desires. So David sent Abner safely on his way. Joab murders Abner. But just after David had sent Abner away in safety, Joab and some of David's troops returned from a raid, bringing much plunder with them. When Joab arrived, he was told that Abner had just been there visiting the king and had been sent away in safety. Joab rushed to the king and demanded, What have you done? What do you mean by letting Abner get away? You know perfectly well that he came to spy on you and find out everything you're doing. Joab then left David and sent messengers to catch up with Abner, asking him to return. They found him at the well of Sirah and brought him back, though David knew nothing about it. When Abner arrived back in Hebron, Joab took him aside at the gateway as if to speak with him privately. But then he stabbed Abner in the stomach and killed him in revenge for killing his brother Asher. When David heard about it, he declared, I vow by the Lord that I and my kingdom are forever innocent of this crime against Abner, son of Ner. Joab and his family are the guilty ones. May the family of Joab be cursed in every generation with the man who has open sores or leprosy, or who walks on crutches, or dies by the sword, or begs for food. So Joab and his brother Abishai killed Abner because Abner had killed their brother Asheel at the battle of Gibeon. David mourns Abner's death. Then David said to Joab and all those who were with him, Tear your clothes and put on burlap. Mourn for Abner. And King David himself walked behind the procession to the grave. They buried Abner in Hebron, and the king and all the people wept at his graveside. Then the king sang this funeral song to Abner. Should Abner have died as fools die? Your hands were not bound. Your feet were not chained. No, you were murdered the victim of a wicked plot. All the people wept again for Abner. David had refused to eat anything on the day of the funeral, and now everyone begged him to eat. But David had made a vow saying, May God strike me and even kill me if I eat anything before sundown. This pleased the people very much. In fact, everything the king did pleased them. So everyone in Judah and all Israel understood that David was not responsible for Abner's murder. Then King David said to his officials, Don't you realize that a great commander has fallen today in Israel? And even though I am the anointed king, these two sons of Zeriah, Joab and Abishai, are too strong for me to control. So may the Lord repay these evil men 
for their evil deeds. Second Samuel chapter 4, the murder of Ishbosheth. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard about Abner's death at Hebron, he lost all courage, and all Israel became paralyzed with fear. Now there were two brothers, Bana and Rechab, who were captains of Ishbosheth's raiding parties. They were sons of Rimon, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, who lived in Berat. The town of Berat is now part of Benjamin's territory because the original people of Berat fled to Gittim, where they still live as foreigners. Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephoseth, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him, and he became crippled. One day, Rechab and Bana, the sons of Rimon from Barath, went to Ishbosheth's house around noon as he was taking his midday rest. The doorkeeper, who had been sifting wheat, became drowsy and fell asleep. So Rechab and Bana slipped past her. They went into the house and found Ishbosheth sleeping in his bed. They struck and killed him and cut off his head. Then taking his head with them, they fled across the Jordan Valley through the night. When they arrived at Hebron, they presented Ishbosheth's head to David. Look, they exclaimed to the king, here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of your enemy Saul, who tried to kill you. Today, the Lord has given my lord the king revenge on Saul and his entire family. But David said to Rechab and Vana, the Lord who saves me from all my enemies is my witness. Someone once told me, Saul is dead, thinking he was bringing me good news, but I seized him and killed him at Ziklag. That's the reward I gave him for his news. How much more should I reward evil men who have killed an innocent man in his own house and on his own bed? Shouldn't I hold you responsible for his blood and rid the earth of you? So David ordered his young men to kill them, and they did. They cut off their hands and feet and hung their bodies beside the pool in Hebron. Then they took Ishbosheth's head and buried it in Abner's tomb in Hebron. My Daily Walk Look up Matthew chapter 12 verse 25 and thoughtfully read it twice. Now ask yourself these two questions. How was this verse proven true in Israel during David's reign? And what does this verse mean in my home? In David's day, many individuals were striving for positions of leadership and power. Some would even scheme, kill, or change sides to fulfill their personal goals. The result was instability, uncertainty, and debt until the nation was united under one head. Many activities compete for your attention. Television, clubs, family activities, civic functions, church meetings, all demand your time and energy. In many homes, the result is confusion, frustration, and lack of focus or unity. Families, like nations, function best when they operate under one head. Hold the family council to talk about leadership in your home. Spend some time looking at Bible passages dealing with headship in the home. Ephesians 5.21, 6.4, and Colossians 3.18-21. Then select the family goal for the coming week something that will honor the Lord and benefit each family member. The family altar would alter many a family. That's all for today, my friends. It was great reading along with you. Have a great day. God bless, and I will see you tomorrow. Lord willing, peace.